Uh, muchísimas gracias, Beatriz, y muchísimas gracias, Presidente Tomás Regalado, uh, por uh, invitarme aquí a participar en esta conferencia. Es un enorme placer uh, estar con ustedes y tener la oportunidad de conversar sobre una región que para nosotros es sumamente importante. Uh, si me permita, voy a ofrecer mis palabras en inglés, pero si este provoca un problema, solamente me indica y voy a ver si, si puedo cambiar. I, I want to underscore just how grateful I am to the Inter-American Institute for Democracy for inviting me to participate in this important conference. And I'm especially grateful to Beatriz Rangel and to Carlos Sanchez Bezarin for their hospitality and the kindness they have shown me uh, during my visit here. And I'm very grateful to all of you for your attention today, and especially for your abiding interest and affection for that remarkable collection of states, governments, peoples, and cultures that we call the Americas. I also want to take a moment to recognize a great public intellectual who has played such an important role in shaping the work of the Inter-American Institute for Democracy but also our understanding of the lasting ties that bind together our hemisphere. I'm speaking of Carlos Alberto Montaner. Yesterday, I had the pleasure and honor of visiting Carlos Alberto and thanking him for the kindness and insight that he has shared with me over these many years and to wish him well as he prepares to leave Miami for Madrid. He will be missed and may God bless him. I cannot think of a better time to face the question posed by this conference, Quo Vadis Latin America. Coming in the immediate aftermath of the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, with the horrific impact of the pandemic still fresh in our minds, still grappling with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's new assertiveness, and surrounded by a world undergoing significant shifts in power wealth and influence that have overturned much of the post-World War II global order and ended the Pax Americana, now is the time to take a closer look at the Americas. The urgency of the question posed here today is heightened by the political transformations uh, undergoing or underway in the United States, and especially the debate among the American people as they search for a new consensus around our purpose in the world and to determine what the trajectory of American power will be throughout the rest of the 21st century. I would like to look at our question, Quo Vadis Latino America, in three different contexts. First, in the global context, what is happening in our larger world and how does it relate to the Americas? Second, in regional terms, what have we accomplished and where are we heading? And finally, in existential terms, do the Americas matter? And what can we expect in this century in the hemisphere we call home? In regard to the global context, I would argue that we are in a world defined by five characteristics. First, the global nature of the challenges we face, whether it be climate change, the pandemic and other health issues, financial crises, migration, and technology disruptions, they affect all countries and cannot be walled off by frontiers or borders. These challenges will intersect and cascade and will fundamentally change how we understand national security. While more traditional understandings of national security will remain valid, they will not sit by themselves as nations and states try to understand how these intersecting crises and their global nature either benefit or undermine the interests and well-being of individual nations. The second characteristic is fragmentation. The pandemic has highlighted the fractured nature of our communities, societies, and regions, 
the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the U.S. response have showed how quickly we could tear down 30 years of investment in Russia and dismantle aspects of the global trading system we spent decades building in order to impose sanctions. The rise of economic nationalism and concerns about the security of supply chains are reshaping globalization. While we will remain bound together by the enduring aspects of trade and technology, our political, social, and cultural differences will be heightened and enhanced and will lead to greater identity politics and more exclusion. Do we have a problem with... Uh... Can you just allow me to... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Should I start over? <laughs> no, no, we're good, we're good. Okay. Um, in other words, the, the point on fragmentation is that we're going to be heading into a, a time of even greater identity politics and greater exclusion, which will be more challenging for our politics. The third characteristic is disequilibrium. The transnational nature of the challenges we face and the fragmentation of our societies and communities will exceed the existing capabilities of governmental systems and structures. We will face crises of governance. There will be a mismatch between the challenges we face and our ability to deal with them. And this will place enormous strains on governments and force political leadership to look for new models of governance. The fourth characteristic is contestation, or the contentiousness of the world that we are going to live in. The Im imbalances created uh, in these circumstances will lead to conflict and greater contestation. Politics will grow more volatile and contentious. Major and emerging powers will jockey to establish and exploit new rules of the road. And although the United States will remain the preeminent superpower capable of projecting its power anywhere at any time, the United States will not be able to project its power everywhere all the time. And this will require it to be judicious about the kinds of conflicts it enters into, and it will require it to work through alliances and surrogates in order to pursue its interests and promote its values in those regions that are if not peripheral, at least far enough on the margins that they cannot require an immediate intervention by the United States. The fifth characteristic is what I would call adaptation. And by that, I mean that success in the 21st century will depend on resilience and the ability to adapt to this rapidly changing world. And the measure of adaptation will be the ability of political leadership to forge new consensus toward collective action and the ability to harness expertise across society to compensate weak state capacity. In a world defined by these characteristics, change will be driven by four factors. The first are the demographics and human development. We live in a world that is aging, although there is a portion of the world that is structurally young Central America, parts of Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. The developed economies are all aging out, and aging out at a rapid pace. I'm 64 years old. I am now part of the largest growing segment of the world's population. Think about that for a minute. You'd think that the largest growing segment of the world's population would be the youngest part of the world, but it's not. It's where I am right now. And that is because of health care, of wealth transfer, and education. And this has a profound impact on politics. It has a profound impact on how nations understand themselves, how they allocate resources, but also how they understand their relationship with, with other nations. But also the nature of human development <clears throat> has been changing dramatically with huge shifts of wealth from west to east, with an increase in longevity in many parts of the world, but not all and a, 
a paradox of progress in which through the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, uh, development has actually uh, moved faster than at any time in human history, and yet we are entering this period of effective gov government breakdown and extreme social stress. The second driver of change is the environment, and this is a, a reality that the world has come to grips with intellectually and conceptually, but has not been able to find the appropriate structures to deal with. But the impact of environmental change is going to be profound, but it is going to be unequal across um, time and space, and it is going to be unequally uh, impactful. Uh, in different countries. And so access to resources, access to the political leadership necessary to use those resources in a meaningful way is going to have a huge impact on how environmental change affects the political dynamics, not only of national and regional politics, but also of global politics. The third driver of change is economics. And I noted that there had been this enormous shift of wealth from west to east and the opening of Asian markets uh, in unprecedented and profound ways. And in, in effect, the reemergence of giant societies like China and India into global markets and into global power structures that is profoundly reshaping the global environment that we live in. But also, we're seeing the emergence of giant corporations and firms that are increasingly uh, have economies the size of small countries and have the ability to impact economies uh, in ways that have been hard to, would have been hard to imagine just a few decades ago. But as these uh, firms grow, how they relate to a society and how they relate to government is going to be profoundly important in terms of how governments respond to the kinds of challenges we face today. And the ability to build partnerships uh, in our economies between empresarial classes, between large corporations and governments for broader social purposes is going to be a defining feature of our success or failure as, as nation states. But also it's going to drive an increasing demand, increasing popular demand for greater regulation uh, and direction of, of economies. And so how you balance that is going to have a, a big impact on how the world advances. And finally, it's technology, which as you all reach for your phones is obvious. What this technology has done is connect the world in unprecedented fashion, but there are disequilibriums in the, in, the, in the technology and inequality of access. And this has created and will create uh, not only digi digital divides, but larger divides of technology that will have an impact on national politics uh, and on global politics. Um, but, um, but also increasingly, technology will be the currency of power. Uh, who controls technology, how it's developed, how it's marketed, how it's sold, how it's used is going to be a defining characteristic of national wealth and national power. Having um, kind of defined the characteristics of the world we're going to live in and the drivers of change, I would argue that this leads to a, a few important conclusions. And the first of these is that uh, we are living through a period of time in which the individual is empowered uh, in ways that I cannot uh, think of at any other time in, in human history. And as the individual in, is empowered, there has been a rise of a global middle class. The, the global middle class was a, uh, or the middle class was a social phenomenon that existed largely in North America, parts of Northern Europe, and maybe Australia and New Zealand. But that has changed. Uh, there are now over 300 million members of the middle class in China, the size of the population of the United States. Uh, and the middle class can be found from Nigeria to Indonesia to South Africa to Mexico to Brazil and beyond. And it is fundamentally changing uh, how national politics take place and how nations relate to each other. And in this regard, um, there's no doubt that the economic crisis of 2008, 2009 and the pandemic have had an impact on the middle class. And while they have squeezed the middle class in some places, they have not eliminated this self-identification of being middle class for many people who even today find themselves no longer part of that middle class. It is still not only an aspiration, it is a question of, of personal identity. And this is a powerful political force. The, the second conclusion worth drawing is that um, access to, to wealth, 
to education, to healthcare, to security, and to technology are going to be defining features of how we understand our societies. And inequality is going to be redefined in terms of that kind of access. It will no longer be understood only in political terms uh, or even in economic terms. It will be under, understood in social terms. Uh, and that inequality or the, the sense of inequality or not being allowed to have access to those uh, to, the, to the wealth, to the technology, to the health care, to the security, to the education necessary for success as an individual in many ways is going to define how individuals understand their relationship to a larger society. Uh, the fourth conclusion is that power has been fundamentally transformed. Uh, while material power, the power of the military, the power of an economy are still important factors in, global, uh, in, in the global understanding of power, the reality is, is that with the empowerment of the individual, the growth of technology, and the way in which technology allows people to organize, there is increasing veto power across our societies and globally. And smaller groups of, of, of organized individuals and individuals themselves can find themselves in positions where they can block governmental initiatives, regional and global initiatives, or cause significant impairment or harm to these initiatives as they are launched and, and moved forward. And the final conclusion worth noting is that in the world we live in, increasingly, legitimacy is going to be defined by outcomes and not by process. This is a challenge for democracies because democracies have historically understood themselves as process-driven forms of government. It's all about free elections. It's all about certain kinds of political rights that allow you to participate in free and fair elections. And then it's all about how institutions function within a constitutional structure that is democratic. That all remains important. But increasingly, uh, our citizens are going to determine the legitimacy of the government, not so much by how it came to power, but what it, what it did once it came to power. And this is a challenge that not only democracies will be facing, but also autocracies and totalitarian governments will be facing. And so having sketched this kind of global context, um, it's important to turn to Latin America, to the Caribbean, to, Central, to broadly to Central America and Mexico and, and North America, our hemisphere, uh, to, to, to review kind of what we've accomplished, where we are, and what lies in front of us. And if you think about this for a moment, through the late 20th century and the first part of the, of the 21st century, um, the Americas were able to fashion an approach to governance, an approach to prosperity, which was quite remarkable. Given the diversity of the countries, from Haiti to the United States, uh, given the diversity of, of wealth, of size, of population, of power, uh, the diversity of language, um, this is a region that found a way to build a commitment around democracy, uh, which it was able to memorialize in a series of, of understandings and agreements that led up to the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which in and of itself is a remarkable document because it asserts that democracy is not a form of government, it is a right. It is a right of all the peoples of the Americas and it underscores that the governments of the Americas have an obligation to promote and defend democracy. But perhaps just as importantly, the Inter-American Democratic Charter also links democracy and development. Uh, our hemisphere is a region that has experimented with many different kinds of development. Capitalist development, authoritarian development, military government development, totalitarian development. But over time, it's become increasingly apparent to our citizens that development that is not tied to democratic processes, that development that is not reflective of the broader needs of our society, ultimately misses the mark and can't address the really significant problems of poverty, inequality, and social exclusion that have haunted our hemisphere uh, across these, these many centuries. And and, and so as the, the region makes this commitment, this radical commitment to democracy, which no other region has made in such dramatic terms and in such formal terms, uh, it put an enormous weight and responsibility on its governments to produce. In other words, to generate the kinds of outcomes I was talking about. And as we look at, at what this region has been able to do, it's really quite remarkable. If you look at the trading agreements that have been built, um, the way in which from Mercosur to NAFTA 
to the free trade agreements in the Caribbean, in Central America, along the Pacific coast of, of South America, uh, a region that was largely autarkic and focused on import substitution models of development, built uh, economies that were uh, really driven by trade and by investment, uh, and we're looking for ways regionally to connect either through uh, smaller trading blocks or larger trading blocks. And although the effort to create a free tra trade area of the Americas failed, we were able to create effectively a patchwork of free trade agreements that built an interconnectivity between uh, capital markets um, and, and merchandise markets um, and, and human labor capital markets that is quite remarkable and is probably only matched in, in the European Union. Uh, but in the process of doing this, they've also built a common commitment to the market economy uh, and a common commitment to the importance of, of globalization. In a region that had largely been isolated in the world, has been glo globalizing at a rapid rate in ways that can be very uncomfortable and unsettling at some times as we see the influx into the region of external powers who are now adversaries of the United States, such as China, uh, but which in many ways are a natural product uh, of this globalization. Um, but as we, as we try to understand the, what has been created, we also recognize very clearly the challenges that are being presented. And as we look out into the region today and see um, the, the nature of electoral combat and the way in which elections are being used to define political power, and then to entrench political power to serve certain interests. As we look at the, the divide that is taking place uh, within the region between um, countries that understand themselves differently from, from their neighbors and beyond, and then as we look at the very special cases of countries like Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, uh, where um, <coughs> effectively uh, any hope of democratic governance has collapsed and societies have found themselves not only abandoned by their own government, but effectively searching for ways to, to find a, a, a pathway back to an understanding of democracy and freedom that once invigorated their societies, uh, but has been lost. And as we, we try to understand what is happening in, in this context, I would argue that in effect, the kinds of debates we're seeing in the region right now, especially those driven by electoral politics, are increasingly not ideological debates. They're increasingly debates about competence and about the ability to produce the outcomes and results that I talked about earlier. Uh, and I'll take Chile as an example of this. The election of President Boric uh, was a, a, a fundamental event in Chilean history, in the sense that the Chilean people, uh, after several decades, had stepped away from a political consensus defined by the Concertación and effectively sought a uh, pronounced leftist political leader to be an agent of change in Chilean society. However, as, as they are doing this, they are also um, at a point of rejecting the constitution that their constituent assembly has, has written for them. And although that vote has not happened yet, and it would be a mistake to predict the results, the, the surveys uh, that are being done, the polling that is being done in Chile right now, indicates that there is real concern among the Chilean people about the constitution that has been drafted by the constituent assembly. And a, an increasing belief that that constitution, instead of being the basis for order and stability, is actually going to be the basis for chaos and confrontation within Chilean society. And so we could find ourselves in the curious instance in which a leftist, uh, a, a admittedly leftist political leader is sitting on top of a government that has rejected, and, and a people that have rejected a, a new constitution and will have to govern based on a constitution written during the Pinochet regime as he looks for a new fashion or a new way of, of, of achieving constitutional reform. And if we look at the election in, uh, in Brazil that will be coming up shortly, we see a highly polarized society uh, that um, is effectively choosing between the current president, Jair Bolsonaro, and the former president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, uh, but at a time in which 
the, the, the election itself is going to be defined by competence and government, governance. In other words, do the Brazilian people believe that Jair Bolsonaro has been able to carry out the kinds of reforms, economic reforms, social reforms, uh, necessary to advance Brazil? Or has his performance during the pandemic been sufficiently damaging um, to lose him the presidency? And whereas Lula da Silva is presenting himself as somebody who governed well during a certain period of time, uh, and, and wants to project that, that vision of competence into a Brazilian society that is struggling for a way uh, uh, forward. But the, the reason I mention these is that I would argue that as we look into our hemisphere, we need to understand the kinds of political debates that are taking place in, in most of the countries around our hemisphere as really being one of outcomes. And, and really about a vision of democracy in which the region is, is asserting that democratic governance is not enough. That democratic government, governance is the basis for creating a democratic society. And in this regard, I would say that our hemisphere, the Americas, is really at the cutting edge of political change and development and is looking for a way to show clearly that democratic government can produce the kind of profound social transformation that our societies need, that it can do so peacefully, that it can do so within constitutional orders and structures, and that the kind of violence that our region has been subjected to over time is, is something that, that we can do away with and that we can find other pathways forward uh, to social advancement. And in this regard, I would say uh, in, in closing that the Americas matter. The Americas matter in a profound way because of the, our political history, because of our broad commitment to democracy, because of our commitment to, to market governments, because of our commitment to trade and investment, and because of the way in which we're going to engage in the world. And, and this is where political leadership is going to become uh, so important. Because I noted that the kinds of, of challenges that we're going to face in this world will stress governments. And it will stress governments in, in ways that they're unaccustomed to and it will challenge our understanding of democracy. But what we need is, first of all, uh, not just engagement by the United States, but cooperation and collaboration throughout the hemisphere. I would argue that we are in a moment of political solidarity in which none of us are in a position to dictate or to, to lecture others on how um, democracy should be conducted or what the next stages of our governance should be but instead that we need to find ways, as we've done in the past, to use our common understandings to build common approaches, cooperation, and collaboration if we want to be successful over time. And in, in, in this regard, I believe that not only the United States, but our many partners around the hemisphere have an opportunity uh, to build off of what we've accomplished and show clearly that the democracies that we have built are capable of profound social change, are capable of, of building relationships between the private sector, between uh, larger civil society, and between our elected leadership to harness the capacity and capability of, our, of all of our societies in order to advance ourselves in ways that are meaningful and that will reflect not only well on ourselves, but will, will be seen as an example, if not a model, for the rest of the world. Um, you have in front of you today uh, four panels that are going to be addressing very specific but important aspects of life in our hemisphere. And I wish them all well. I look forward to the discussion. I thank you all for your patience and your willingness to listen to me today. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you.